Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host. Thank you for joining today. And I'm a little bit sleepy today. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I I stayed up too late last night. I wish I could blame that on someone else, but the call's coming from inside the house on this one. I mean, it's kind of your fault. Some of you have asked me to watch Barry and let me know what, what I think about it. And I I'm almost afraid to tell you what I think so far. I'm not even finished with the first season, uh, but it's a struggle. It's not that good. I wanted it to be really good. And maybe the problem is it's the the main role of Barry, who is a hired killer. That's what he is. Uh, The main role, it's played by a guy who I've only ever seen in comedies. And I keep expecting him to be funny, and he's not funny. But I think any moment now, he's going to say something funny, and it's not funny. And another part of the problem may be that One of my favorite all-time shows is Dexter, a serial killer, and this is Barry, I guess kind of a serial killer. He's a hired killer, so he is a serial killer. It just feels like a low-key ripoff. I don't know. But that's why I'm tired. I'm trying to get through the first season. And so far, no bueno. And I know you guys keep telling me it's going to get better. You have to wait through the the boring parts, and and it eventually gets better. So I'm waiting on that. So we'll see how it goes. Hey, if this is your first time listening to 10 Minute Murder, please subscribe now so that you can catch up on all the back episodes. Never miss any of the new ones. Connect on social media. See the visuals of what we're talking about here on the podcast. And if you like this episode, please leave a rating and review any place that is possible. Go to 10minutemurder.com for all things related to 10 Minute Murder. Now to today's story. In the 1990s, gay men were an easy target for prowling killers and sexual predators. Many witnesses would avoid coming forward, refusing to admit that they'd been having a homosexual encounter or been present at a gay bar. In a way, some of these victims could have been killed in almost plain sight. People would pretend they didn't see it. But investigators in the Indianapolis Police Department had been working hard for years trying to make connections between missing gay men who seemed to have several common characteristics. Similar height, similar weight, and age, last seen in the same general location. It all had the makings of the work of a serial killer. Finally, in 1992, a breakthrough came when a witness came forward, identifying himself as Tony Harris. Tony told investigators that he believed his friend, Roger Goodlett, had been murdered by a regular at a gay bar that they attended. Tony had noticed that the suspect, who went by the name Brian Smart, had also shown unusual amount of interest in Roger's disappearance. Also, Tony knew that Brian was violent in the past. Brian had attempted to asphyxiate Tony to death with a pool hose. Tony managed to escape the attack, but Brian Smart was an alias. and Without the man's real name, there were no further leads. Three years later, Tony saw Brian again. He recognized his assailant instantly. He followed his car and was able to write down the license plate number. Once again, Tony went straight to the police with his findings, and this time, it gave them the connection they needed to move the investigation forward. A name. The license plate number that Tony wrote down belonged to a local man by the name of Herbert Ballmeister. From an early age, Herb Ballmeister was already earning the media nickname that would one day be given, Herbert the Pervert. By all accounts, there was no childhood trauma that led him to developing his obsession with obscure and obscene sexual fetishes. In fact, he lived a cookie-cutter childhood, born to well-off parents and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, along with three younger siblings. Herb wasn't shy about discussing his fascination with one particular body function, urine. He was obsessed, and several of his childhood friends remembered young Herbert wondering What would it be like to taste human urine? In school, he acted out by urinating on the desks of several teachers. It wasn't just urine that fascinated Herbert, though. He was also intrigued by death and dying. This led to a frequent antisocial hobby of playing with the corpses of dead animals. When Herbert's father, a very well-respected anesthesiologist, found out 
about Herbert's strange obsessions, he took action immediately. Herbert was assessed by a mental health professional who diagnosed the young boy with both antisocial personality disorder and schizophrenia. However, despite these serious diagnoses at such a young age, there was never any push for Herbert to receive any further mental health treatment. For the rest of his high school years, Herb remained socially withdrawn and outcast. In adulthood, Herbert continued to make everybody around him uncomfortable. He was a bizarre mix of character traits, managing to hold down jobs because of his dogged work effort and then losing them in a repeated cycle. He got married in 1971 and he had three children with his wife, Juliana. Despite Juliana reporting that she has never seen Herbert naked and, in fact, the couple had sexual intercourse less than 10 times during their 25-year-long relationship. Juliana tried her best to be understanding about Herb's glaring health issues, which placed a significant strain on their relationship. Within six months of their wedding, Herb's father had him committed to a mental hospital. Initially, after investigators got a hold of Herbert's license plate number, he refused to allow investigators to search his property, and Juliana backed up her husband's demands. There was no hard evidence to connect him to the case, and police couldn't really push that any further. However, Herbert's unusual and often frightening behavior was getting worse, and shortly after he was identified as a suspect in the missing persons cases, Juliana decided that she wanted to get a divorce. She'd had enough of Herbert and his secrets, and she held one final trump card over him. After she filed for divorce, she finally gave investigators permission to search the farm they lived on while Herbert was out of town. A search of Herbert's property confirmed suspicions that he was a killer. Eleven sets of human remains were located, with eight bodies able to be positively identified. What investigators didn't realize was that one of these bodies had possibly been discovered earlier by Herbert's own child. One day in 1994, Herbert's son found a human skeleton buried in the backyard of the family home. He told his parents about what he had found, and Herb reassured him that the skeleton was actually a dissecting skeleton that had been given to him by his father. Then he reburied it, with no explanation as to why it was in their yard in the first place. And it's honestly pretty incredible that this lie was believed by anyone, because who buries a medical specimen in their own yard and then later reburies it? It was obvious that Herb's family had seen the skeleton of one of the missing men. Police issued a warrant for Herbert's arrest. Suspecting that his property had been searched and knowing that his secret he had spent so long concealing was about to be revealed, Herb could not allow himself to be arrested. In his opinion, his life was already in tatters, and this was the final straw. He drove to Lake Huron and shot himself in the head at a park, leaving behind a three-page suicide note, which, incredibly, did not mention the disappearances or explain the 11 bodies found on his property. Instead, he used his suicide note to express regret for his failed career and impending divorce. The bodies found on Herbert's land were called the Fox Hollow Farm Victims, the name of Herbert's 18-acre Woodlands property. Although eight of the victims were able to be identified, all of them males who went missing in Indianapolis, most of them gay, three are still unknown. Despite the coroner's office making public appeals for members of the public to carry out DNA tests, it's widely believed that there are many more human remains on the property and that these were not Herbert's only victims. In fact, Herbert is believed to be responsible for more than just the Fox Hollow Farm killings. He became the prime suspect in another case, an uncaptured serial killer known as the I-70 Strangler. As the name suggests, this killer strangled his victims to death, then dumped them close to Interstate 70 throughout the 80s and early 90s. And like Herbert, he preferred to target men, but also killed young boys. Bodies of the I-70 Strangler's victims stopped being dumped near the interstate during 1991, exactly when Herbert bought the Farm Hollow property. Investigators believe that, with 18 acres of woodland at his disposal, Herbert switched from dumping the bodies and risking evidence being discovered to disposing of his victims on his own property. If Herbert truly was the I-70 Strangler, his victim count is much higher than the reported number. There were 11 confirmed victims of the Strangler, in addition to the still unknown amount of bodies on Herbert's farm. Two other missing gay men, Alan Livingston and Jerry Williams Comer, are also believed to have been killed by Herbert, although their bodies were never found. 
It's unknown if Herbert ever had any other disposal sites for bodies, or if Interstate 70 and Fox Hollow Farm were the only resting places for his victims. In 2022, a fresh search of Fox Hollow Farm located yet another piece of human body, as well as identifying a total of 20 separate locations where human remains may have been buried deep underground. So many questions remain. What was his motive? Why did he start killing and who was his first victim? And the big question, how many victims are there in total? In Herbert's final action, by putting a gun to his own head and leaving behind a pointless suicide note, he ensured that those answers would be as difficult to find as possible. Although Herbert the pervert left his victim's families and his own family without closure or justice, some of his darkest secrets are likely still buried on the farm that he, his wife, and his children once called home. 